Welcome to another COVID-19 video. This one, let's talk about how we cannot get the coronavirus while traveling. I'm also going to answer the question, is it better to fly or to drive? Which, spoiler alert, it depends. And if you haven't done so already, I do highly recommend you watch my previous video on airborne transmission because what I say here in this video will make more sense to you. In brief, this virus spreads by all three routes. It spreads by contact, it spreads by respiratory droplets that act like ballistics, and it spreads by the airborne route, meaning very tiny droplets or aerosols remain suspended in the air, which then can be inhaled by someone else. So we know about hand washing or using hand sanitizer, not touching your face or mask with dirty hands, and trying to maintain at least six feet. But is that enough? Probably not, because catching a respiratory virus, such as coronavirus in general, especially in an airplane, is possible by inhaling the virus. In the regular face covering that you wear, such as a medical mask or a surgical mask, that's not going to prevent you from inhaling that virus if it's in the air close to you. So recently there was this, where three people tested positive on a Delta flight, which was a, about a two hour flight. So how is the virus transmitted? We'll never really know for sure because you can't prove one way or another in this instance if it was spread by means of contact versus respiratory droplets or airborne transmission. But let's talk about some things that we do know. Most airlines are requiring passengers to wear masks. In fact, starting today, July 20th, Delta will now require passengers who can't wear a mask because of a health condition to consider staying home. And if they insist on flying, the passenger must complete a health screening before being allowed to fly. Delta will ultimately decide whether the passenger will be allowed to travel without wearing a mask. Now, this is sort of a back and forth game, right? People don't have real medical exemptions from not wearing a mask. That's just a cover because they don't want to wear one. So Delta is recognizing this and saying, well, we know how this virus spreads. So if people refuse to wear a mask because of a health condition, then we'll have to consult with our doctors to see if they can fly because of their health condition. So this is Delta's roundabout way of saying, wear the mask or don't fly. And that's the right thing to do because you're risking other people's lives by not wearing one. I feel like I should make a video on this whole medical exemption from wearing a mask debate. What do you think? Leave a comment below and let me know. Anyway, some airlines are also taking other measures to minimize person-to-person -person interaction, such as not serving alcoholic beverages or skipping snacks altogether. Peanut? Yes, I have one right here. It's bulky, but I consider it carry-on. Most commercial flights these days have very clean cabin air. Airplanes accomplish this by the way they have their air intake system set up. Essentially, they have compressed air passing through the jet engines with its temperature being super hot, like 250 degrees Celsius hot or 482 degrees Fahrenheit hot. I, hot, hot, hot. I love that song, especially at weddings and cruise ships. That hot air is then cooled and put under pressure. 450 pounds per square inch to be exact. So between the initial hot temperatures and the high pressure, that makes the air in the cabin very sterile as bacteria and viruses become destroyed in that process. Before the mid 1980s, planes would actually use 100% fresh air for the cabin, but to save money, they redesigned the ventilation systems so that it's 50% fresh air and 50% recirculated air in the cabin. Now, would it be better to have 100% fresh air? Technically, yeah, but because of the hot temperatures and the high pressures, the subsequent cabin air is still very clean and the cabin air is exchanged every three to four minutes, which is actually better than offices and homes, which is typically every five to 12 minutes. Also with the newer generations of airplanes, they have high efficiency particulate air filters, meaning HEPA filters. These filter out the recirculated air. They can fish out particles as small as 0.3 microns, which is what an N95 respirator mask can do, as well as an elastomeric mask. Now, some might say, well, the virus is only about 0.1 microns in diameter or 100 nanometers. And this is true, but most of the virus in the air is going to exist within respiratory droplets. So the bottom line is, if the virus is in the air, most of it, about 95% of it, will be filtered out with these HEPA filters on the plane. And the same thing goes for respirator masks. And for the virus that remains in the air that does not exist within a respiratory droplet that floats in the air, we still don't know if that virus is able to maintain infectivity because it may be dried out and inactivated in the process. So let's take a look at this scenario. 
Let's say there's a passenger who is infected with coronavirus. They probably don't even have symptoms. Hopefully, they're wearing a mask, which they should be wearing, one for this specific reason. Because whether they have symptoms or not, they're going to expel that virus, especially if they cough or sneeze. So that person is going to expel that virus into a moist cloud that lingers in the air, which will be readily available for their neighbors to inhale. When someone is expelling respiratory droplets, the ones that are at least 5 to 10 microns in size, those are the ones that are going to act like ballistics and fall within 6 to 12 feet of them, if they are not wearing a mask. The respiratory droplets expelled that are less than 5 microns, these are the ones that will stay suspended in the air, much like a fart. And don't you hate it when someone lets one rip on the plane, though? What do you do? You hold your breath, you look around for likely suspects, but there's never a guilty verdict. And they're usually a repeat offender, right? And you just pray you'll be landing soon. But getting back to the aerosols that are expelled from the mouth, if someone is wearing a mask, it will drastically reduce the size of that moist cloud, and it'll reduce the size that that cloud can travel, but it won't totally prevent the virus from being airborne. So if no one is sitting close to you, or if someone is sitting close to you but doesn't have the virus, then no worries. But of course, people are going to be close to you on the plane, and it's impossible to know who has the virus. And if that virus is in the air close to you, you're going to breathe that in. Unless you do tip number one, which is you wear an N95 respirator mask or an elastomeric respirator. Both of these filter out at least 95% of airborne particles that are as small as 0.3 microns. Right now, the CDC recommends the public to not purchase and wear these N95 respirator masks. For one, because they need to be reserved for healthcare workers, which I don't understand how there can be a limited supply this deep into a pandemic, but I digress. And by the way, Amazon will not sell them right now. The other reasons why it's generally advised for the public not to wear them. Well, N95 respirators are tight fitting and people who wear them have to be test fitted meaning the mask is on properly so that it can effectively do its job, which also means facial hairstyles are limited because of the potential to disrupt the tight fit. Basically, you can't have any facial hair outside of the zone where the N95 respirator is gonna go on the face. So here it is, the N95, which you probably cannot buy and you probably will not wear on a plane. And I'll get to the alternative in a second, but here's the N95 and this is a wire. It's a hard wire where you've bend it around your nose so it basically secures a tight fit there and not supposed to have facial hair so when I go back to work I can't even have this I'm gonna have to shave but essentially right here it's gonna make a tight fit around here and the proper way to go about this is to actually get a test fit where they spray a chemical so that they can see if you smell the chemical if you can smell it then it's not a good fit so that's how we determine that also, these masks are uncomfortable, and it's not practical to wear them for more than a few hours. However, if there are enough of these to go around for the public, I don't see why they can't be recommended for certain situations like when you're in an enclosed space with other people, such as a subway train or in an elevator or on an airplane. There's also the issue of keeping the masks sterile. So they can actually be re-sterilized by baking them in an oven set at 160 degrees for 30 minutes. I'm not joking. That's really the best and the most practical way to re-sterilize them is 160 degree dry heat for 30 minutes. Alternatively, if you happen to have seven of these masks laying around, you can wear one new one each day of the week. And for the ones that you're not using, keep them in a dry, isolated place. This way, the viruses and bacteria will just die off. So for now, the CDC says the public should not buy them and should not wear them, but what you can do is get yourself an elastomeric respirator. This is a reusable device with exchangeable cartridge filters. Like an N95 respirator, it also filters out at least 95% of airborne particles as small as 0.3 microns. It fits tight against the user's face and it's more comfortable than an N95. And before reusing this mask, all of its surfaces need to be wiped down with a disinfectant. So although both of these are not perfect, they are very effective at preventing inhaling the virus. Now, if I were to buy one, I'd probably go with this one, the 3M7503 Large Silicone Ultimate 7500 series, as it gets great reviews on Amazon. And I'll put a link to that in the description below. 
All right, tip number two, I definitely recommend eye goggles that prevent air from blowing into your eyes because that's another way for the virus to infect you. You might be able to see here on the side, the air really can't get in, so not gonna get to your eyes, or at least it's very low likelihood. And they're very cheap. These are my cheap motorcycle goggles I have here. And I also have the cheap sunglasses version here, just in case it's very sunny and bright on the plane, like when they don't pull the window shade down and all that sun gets in. But anyway, you can get these on Amazon as well, and I'll put a link to them below. So go get yourself some cheap sunglasses. All right, now on to tip number three. Those overhead jets on the plane, probably gonna wanna turn those on. Why? Because stagnant air is the enemy here. Stagnant air makes it easier for the virus to linger in the air. Not only that, but those overhead jets actually will push that air downwards with that jet. So if the virus is in that air, it's essentially it's gonna be pushed toward the floor, making you less likely to infect you. Tip number four, avoid people. Impossible, you say? Yes, but you can get the super early flights or the red eye flights and consider getting a business class seat if you can, or better yet, a private jet. Tip number five, avoid long flights because the longer the flight, the more potential exposure. What makes someone more likely to inhale the virus is really a combination of factors. Now, one of those factors is the amount of time you spend in close contact with someone who has the virus. This is why people who live in the same household as someone who has the virus is more likely to get it. It's also why healthcare workers are more likely to get it. So keep that in mind when you're booking longer trips. All right, so tip number six, bring the hand sanitizer with you because you're gonna be getting your hands dirty a lot. Those respiratory droplets land on everything. So anytime you touch something, there's a potential to get the virus on your hands. And of course, don't touch your face with your hands, at least if they're not clean. And this is the same rationale for my final tip number seven, which is bring sanitizing wipes so that you can wipe the tray if you're gonna use the tray. Now doing all of these things still does not guarantee that you won't get the virus, but it dramatically improves your chances of not getting it. The other nice thing about implementing these measures, trying to look on the bright side here, is that they'll prevent inhalation of other respiratory infectious diseases, such as measles, tuberculosis, and influenza. Yes, influenza is mostly respiratory droplet transmission, but is sometimes transmitted by means of aerosol. And then there are other viruses that cause the common cold, such as other coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, and human metanumaviruses, and others as well. So is it better to drive instead of to fly? Kind of depends. If you're by yourself, no worries. Just make sure to maintain the usual precautions throughout the trip. Like when you take breaks from driving, you're gonna wanna wear the mask, wash your hands, and all that other stuff. Avoiding handshakes, avoiding hugs and kisses. She's my sister. But the more people in the car, the higher the likelihood of someone spreading the virus if someone does have it. So for multiple people in the car, better to wear masks and definitely crack open a window or two. So you can have that window down a few inches and that way if the virus is aerosolized, it'll just fly out the window, which is also what you can do when someone lets one rip. So which one is better, flying or driving? It really depends on a lot of different factors. Other things you might wanna consider is the destination. Do they have a quarantine rule there if you do fly there? Overall, I'd say driving is probably better, especially if you're going by yourself. But as long as you know the preventative measures that you can implement, you'll minimize your chances of getting the virus, whether you're flying or driving.